I'm going to take my coat off because I'm warm. It's hot up here. You know, please uh, pray for those who are not here today. Maybe they're away. Maybe they're doing something. Are you blessed this morning? Amen. Praise God. If you're a little warm, come up front here. The, the vent's right here. You get nice and cool over here. Praise God. The title of my message this morning is Why Revival is Needed. Why Revival is Needed. And uh, we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you this morning. I want to say hello to uh, Linda up in Maine, who's watching this morning, and also to Sajiv, who's watching in India right now. And so, and anyone else who may uh, tune in, thank you, honey, uh, that will come and and, uh, oh, you can bring it up for me. Yep. And uh, those who may be watching from all different parts, we have sometimes people cutting in and watching from China all over the place. And thank God we can broadcast live. Amen? Well, I'm excited why we need revival in the church today. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And before we get into it today, I want to give a little background of what we're going to be talking about. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot of people, to, you know, in the recent times say, we're not to judge. Don't judge. You ain't got the right to judge. And I, and I want you to understand something. We're not to judge those who are unsaved. Those are the ones we're not to judge because they're just living out their life in their sinful nature. But the Bible makes it very clear that we're to judge those that are within the church. And I'll share it with that uh, with you this morning. But because we have not done that, uh, there's something called church discipline that has been missing from the church for a long, long time. And I want to dare to say this, and I don't care if people get mad at me, but that's okay. Because if you get mad, then you have to get glad. And then you have to love me anyway. Praise God. But many people don't want to bring discipline into the church because they're afraid of losing money. They're afraid of losing their tithe and their offerings. But I'm not afraid of that because I don't care about that because God has always met our needs, and, and I just preach what he tells me to preach, and where the, the uh, uh, chips fall is where they fall. And so uh, I'm not here to be a man pleaser. I'm not here to uh, have big crowds so that I can lift up my name and lift up who I am. I'm going to lift up who Jesus is. And I say, it's, people say, well, if, if you have a big church and you have a large church, then that means that Jesus is with you. Not necessarily, because Jesus had 9,000 followers. He fed 5,000, then he fed 4,000. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, let me ask you how many were with him. Zero. Because when it comes time to crucifixion, when it comes time crucifying the flesh, nobody wants to do that. We've got so much flesh in the church that the, the church is actually dying we got so much flesh in the church that the church is no longer seeing the gifts in manifestation. And the reason why is because we got so much flesh in the church. Come on, somebody. But because the discipline has been removed from the church, and now we have a, what I call a lopsided view of God. God is love, and so therefore that's all we look at, and that's all we talk about is his love. But no, God is also holy. He's also just. And so we're going to talk a little bit about church discipline and what is needed today because I really believe that in order for revival to come, the church needs to get straightened out. Now, we're to love people and we're to help people, but we're also to be a a voice for God to give you direction and help you make the right decisions in your life according to the Bible. Not according to me, not according to Mama uh, Langevin, but according to the Word of God. Amen? And so if we do that, then we're going to see revival. When we've been uh, coming together on Monday nights, it was, uh, at, when we first started, it was maybe five or seven. Now there's over 20. We've got two people coming all the way up from Boston area because they want to be here for prayer on Monday night. And she uh, lives in, uh, Med uh, where, where does she live? Mattapan. And her daughter works in Brockton. And her, her daughter leaves Brockton at 4 o'clock and goes, picks up her daughter in Mattapan and comes all the way back here for 7. They don't even eat. 
We've been fasting and we've been praying and God's been moving by His Spirit. Hallelujah. But I want you to understand that I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with just Monday night. I'm not satisfied just with God moving because I want you to understand, though we come together and we sing and we praise Him and we worship Him and we get touched by Him, that's not why we're here. We're not here to get touched. We're here to see Him. We're here to glorify Him. It's not about us. And we need to turn it back around and say, God, it's all about you. It's not what I can get from you, but it's, God, what can I do for you? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And so we've been coming together and God's been moving, but I, I don't want you to come just for an experience. I want you to come and I want you to enjoy the presence of the Lord, but I want you to seek Him. What's going to happen when you seek Him? And I've been talking to Pastor Mike Kelly down in the Cape, and he's been coming, him and his wife, and Pastor Manny's been coming off and on, and Pastor Josias has come, and we've opened it up to others that want to come. What Pastor Mike has been saying is, he says, God's doing a cleaning in my heart. Come on, somebody. See, when we have God and God shows up somewhere, it's not just to give us goosebumps and ducky bites and make us feel good. When God shows up, it's because He wants to do something greater, something deeper, something more meaningful in our life. And what's going to happen is, sad to say, is some will come and they'll get touched, but when God starts to put His finger on areas of their life, they're going to back up. They don't come anymore. They come sporadically, and then finally they don't come at all. Because God is putting his finger on our lifestyle. God is putting his finger on the things that we have been secretly keeping in our hearts. Come on, somebody. And God says, if you want me, he says, I dwell in light that is unapproachable. But if you want to dwell in me, then my light's going to shine on some darkness. And my light's going to shine in your heart. And I'm going to put my finger on some things. And you've got to come to this altar and you've got to give them over to God once and for all and say, God, here I am. Just as I am, I come without one plea. Here I come, God. I'm coming to be cleansed. I'm coming to be cleansed by your Holy Spirit. I'm coming to be purified by your fire, God. Let your fire purify those things in my heart. It's the reason why we need revival. Church has become a social club. Church has come, become a place where people just gather together and clap their hands and have a good time and go home and live like the devil. Come on, somebody. It's time that we change things around and we say, now, I mean, come on now. If you really want God, if I really want God, we're going to pay the price that's necessary. If you really want the touch of God, I'm talking about Almighty God. I'm not talking about some statue. I'm not talking about some false God. I'm talking about the real God. If you want the real God to touch you, hallelujah, you can't come on your terms. You must come on His terms. You must come before Him. You must seek Him. The Bible says, love not the world. You notice no one said amen. Because that's the problem. People love the world. They love the system of the world. They love the things of the world. But God's word says, for you and I not to love the world, nor the things that are in the world. For if you have a love for the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Come on. I'm talking about Holy Ghost filled Holy Ghost revival that will set New Bedford on fire not so that we can see all kinds of uh, gifts flowing but it will show a good s s a seed of evangelism. When they got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost they didn't just sit there God said, 
You go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the earth. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, it's not so that you and God can have a, a two-way conversation. Now, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. God says, I've called you. You are part of my church. You're supposed to reflect who I am. Hallelujah. I want to be a reflection of who he is. Hallelujah. I want to talk to those who are looking at us right now by, tele, by the telecommunications uh, that we're doing this morning. I want you to know this morning that you cannot continue in your sin doing what you want. And you can come and you can accept God and just raise your hands and praise God and live like the devil. You'll go to hell. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't make excuses. No excuses because when that trumpet sounds... The only ones that are going to go are the ones that are doing the will of the Father. Come on, somebody. That's what the Bible says. They that are saved are them that do the will of my Father. So don't tell me for one minute that that doesn't involve you doing something. Well, salvation is free, Pastor. Yeah, it's free, but you've got to do something. Faith without works is dead. I believe that there's coming a revival. I believe that God is stirring. God is moving in a powerful way. We've been praying and we're seeing God do some things. That he's starting to uh, realign, if you will, things. And he's beginning to move things. He's beginning to push back the atmosphere of evil. Come on, somebody. But we've got to move with him. We've got to be willing to obey him. Why we need revival is because the church is just about dead. Now, I've, I've been trained in CPR, and I've been trained on the ADR machine, you know, with that machine they put on you for your heart. What is it called? AED, that's it. I've been trained on that, so I know how to use it. And what you do is you put that thing on a body that's dead, and you flip that switch, and it says clear, clear, clear. And all of a sudden, I don't know how many volts of electricity goes through that body. But can I tell you, you got someone greater that wants to touch you with a greater anointing. His name is the Holy Spirit. He's greater than any electrical power. Hallelujah. That can touch you and transform you and change you. Hallelujah. To be the person that he wants you to be. Don't let me hear any excuses that I'm this and I'm that and I'm weak and I'm that. God says, put your weakness in my hand. Put yourself in my hand. Put your flesh on the cross and let the cross crucify it. Come on, somebody. God wants to send a revival and we need it desperately because the church is on respiratory uh, uh, arrest. Can hardly breathe. Like the church has got asthma. <laughs> Can't hardly breathe. Because they're not getting the air. The Holy Ghost needs to come back in church. Men and their programs have taken over. Very seldom do you hear gifts of the Spirit in the church. Very seldom do you hear tongues with interpretation. You don't hear it anymore. People are afraid to speak out. No long, very seldom do you hear a, a solid biblical word of prophet, a prophet of prophetic utterance. It's all about how good you are and how great you look and how much money you're going to get. When a real prophet comes your way, he's going to tell you what you need, not what you want. He's going to speak the word of God with power and anointing. Oh, they don't like the prophets. Read about the prophets. Most of them were killed. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 1. If you could put the NLT up there for me, I'd appreciate it. Here's the church of Corinth. Church flowing in the gifts. Church where the Spirit of the Lord was moving. But something 
in the underlying of the church was not being dealt with. And so Paul the Apostle, he says in verse 1, he says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. He was having sexual relationships with his father's wife. I, we're all shaking our heads, but you know what? That goes on quite a bit in some churches. Some of the largest churches in New York have homosexual uh, choir directors. Come on. And see, nothing's being done because they don't want to lose the financial gain that they've had. But here in this church in Corinth, there was a man who was having a sexual relationship with his with a stepmother. Ooh. Ooh. And verse 2 says, and you are puffed up. You're full of pride. And rather not have mourned that he that hath done this Deed. Let me read it in the NIV here, uh, the NLT. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Now, if it's a woman, same thing. Well, folks, can I tell you something? That takes judgment to do that. See, the reason why we're not experiencing, I'm talking about a genuine revival. I'm not talking about these little signs they hang up outside the church revival this week. I'm talking about the Welsh revival and these, these Swedish revivals and these revivals that took place in Azusa Street that went on for years and years and years. Brother Seymour in Azusa Street preached, I think it was like six to eight times a day for three years straight. That's a revival. That's when the bar rooms close. That's when the, the drug addiction goes down. That's when the alcoholic uh, people get uh, uh, statistics, statistics go down. And they get saved and lawyers get saved. They, mom, lawyers need to get saved, believe me. Doctors get saved. Policemen get saved. Firemen get, get saved. The community gets saved. The mayor gets saved. The governor gets saved. We need a revival. Especially living up here in liberal la-la land in Massachusetts. He said, you should have removed this man from your fellowship. And he says, for verily I am absent. Let me read it from the NLT. Go to the next verse. I'm reading from this King James. I like King James. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. What happened to the phraseology, judge, don't judge. Nobody's to judge today. Can I tell you, that's why we don't have revival. Nobody's judging anything. They're letting everything and anything into the church. He says, I've already passed judgment on this person. Well, that's not very loving, Pastor, and that's not very reconciliation, Pastor. You know, you should love him anyway and, and just, you know, kind of help him along. No! He don't want to repent. Next verse. In the name of the Lord Jesus, or on the authority of the Lord. That's what the word name means. It means authority. The authority of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church 
I'll be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. I want you to understand the power of the Lord Jesus is there in discipline in the church. He's there. Next verse. Then you must throw this man out. Whoa, that's a little harsh. You must throw this man out. Now, let me tell you, this next part is a little tough to swallow. And hand him over to the angels, Satan. Hello? You hand him over to Satan. Ouch. I'm not going to that church anymore, brother. They hate people. They turn people over to Satan. Hello? Turn him over to Satan that his sinful nature will be destroyed. And he himself will be saved on that day the Lord returns. But I like what the King James says. Put that up in King James for me. Because sometimes these versions kind of change things to make it a little more, you know. To deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of flesh that the spirit may be saved. It's not a guarantee. You say, well, pastor, if somebody goes through that, surely they're going to repent. Not necessarily. The Bible says in Revelation is going to come a time when the judgment of God comes upon them that they're going to cry out for the rocks to fall on them and kill them, and they're not going to repent. You know, not everybody's going to repent. You know there are enemies to the cross of Christ? Go back to the NLT to the next verse. Your boasting about this is terrible. How could they be boasting? How could they be boasting in this? You want to know why? Because the gifts were still flowing. Things were still happening. Come on. Things were still moving. So they were looking at the outward manifestation of things and thinking that they were all right. And I tell you, never, ever judge a church by the gifts that are being uh, manifested. Always judge the church by the truth. Don't ever believe someone that, that says, I believe, and that they're a Christian. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. If a person comes and says they believe, you look for the fruit. Doesn't mean, you're, doesn't mean you're saved if you believe. My Bible tells me the devil believes. Is he saved? Come on. Somebody answer me. Somebody talk to me. The, de the devil says, the Bible says that the devil, the demons, the demon spirits, they believe. Are they saved? So believing doesn't make you saved. Hallelujah. It's becoming a disciple of Christ and giving your life over to him. Not simply because you say, I believe. Are you hearing me? Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Next verse. Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next verse, please. 
So let us celebrate the festival not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Can I tell you that's missing from the church? Sincerity and truth. We've sacrificed truth for numbers. We've become more like the world rather than like Jesus. Our pulpits are no longer in place. We have tables now. The pastor no longer dresses up. He wears his holy jeans, H, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H. He wears his holy jeans, and he sits up there with a cup of coffee in his Bible and gives you a 20-minute sermonette. The altar's all painted black. The crosses are taken down. There's no more choirs. There's no more pulpit. Because they're trying to identify with the world. And they got their blue lights and the purple lights and the white lights and the green lights all flashing in the background. Can I tell you something? You can't fool me. I came out of the nightclub business. You go into a nightclub, it's all dark. You go into a nightclub, you get all the lights flashing. I'm surprised that no one in the church has come up with a disco ball in the middle of the... They do have them? Oh, my God. God help us. We need sincerity and truth back in the church. No pretenses. No make-believism. But what's really going on in your heart and your soul? Is it any wonder why they got rid of the altar? Is it any wonder why you don't see people crying out to God at the altar? No, they're running to the Christian psychologist. And God has all the answers. I want to talk to those who are watching, maybe have some psychological problems. There was a man in the Bible who had a psychological problem. He was, in a, he was running around in a cemetery naked all the time. He would cut himself with stones and bleed. He'd cry out like a, like a wild animal. Jesus came from the other side. He came to that shoreline. As soon as he stepped on that shoreline, that, that man came running over to him as naked as a jaybird. And he said, Jesus, what have you done coming at this time? Have you come to torment us? And Jesus cast that spirit out of him. Jesus didn't say, uh, well, make an appointment with the, the Christian psychologist next week and, and come in and talk to him, and he'll, he'll try to get you uh, some medication, and you can be, you'll be all upset. Not that I'm against medication. I'm not against doctors. Understand that. But I'm telling you, we've leaned too much on that. If we need to get back to the altar of God and say, God, and that man that was in the garden that was full of uh, all these psychological problems, the Bible says after Jesus got done with him, he was sitting there in his right mind. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I wish a lot of people would start sitting at the feet of Jesus in their right minds. Next verse. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. Hello? I wrote to you before. In other words, you didn't get it. So I'm writing to you again. <laughs> I'm telling you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. Come on. Why? Let me explain a little bit more. 
Next verse. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers. Come on. Now that doesn't mean you go hanging with them either. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual are right, greedy. Uh oh. Now he's now he's gonna see when God sheds light, it's not just on one area. There's more stuff in there. Come on, somebody. He says, sexual sin are, are greedy or cheat people. Come on. Or worship idols. He says, I'm not talking about the unbelievers that do all these things. You would have to leave the world to avoid people like that. But the next verse. But I meant that you are not to what? Say it again. Say it louder. Now you're responsible. God's going to hold you accountable. Not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy. Or worships idols. Or is abusive. Or is a drunkard. Or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. Now I'm not talking about unsaved people. I'm talking about people in the church. You mean there were people like that in the church? Yes. He's not just talking in the air. He's talking to straighten out something that's going on in the church. You want to know someone who's an idol worshiper? Now, of course, when we talk about idol worshipers, well, automatically our, our minds click over to Roman Catholicism. What does the Bible say? Idolatry is as the sin, listen to me, idolatry is as the sin of stubbornness. That's what the Bible says. If you're stubborn, you're an idol worshiper. See, we don't talk about that in church, you know. We don't want to talk about that. Yes, we do. If you want revival, these are the things we're going to talk about. And we're going to make sure that we're right with God. God will not accept second best. God will not accept you putting him second to your family. Hello? God's not going to accept you putting everything else first before him. Not, it's not acceptable. Non-negotiable. Can't do it. Next verse. Isn't it my responsibility to judge outsiders? It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. We're not to judge the outsider, the unsaved person. <clears throat> God's going to judge them. <clears throat> you say to me, but pastor, you know, it says in Matthew, judge not lest you be judged. Read the context. The context there is someone who's making a judgment but they're doing the very same thing that that person is doing. That's why Jesus said, why do you want to cast a speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite? See, that's what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is telling somebody to take something out of their eye, and you're doing the same thing. He said, you've got a beam in your own. He has a little speck with that problem with that sin, but you've got a big problem with that sin. But it's the same sin. That doesn't, that, that's not a proof scripture to not judge. Because then he says in that scripture, he says, first remove the beam out of your own eye and then go take the speck out of your brother's eye. So that's judgment. 
Come on, you're getting some biblical teaching this morning. So when you hear these people all the time, especially on Facebook, ah, yeah, yeah, don't judge, nobody judges. I say, That's the problem, even in America, judges are misjudging. I've been to two police officers' funerals, one in, one in Yarmouth and one in uh, Falmouth. No, Yarmouth and uh, Weymouth. All because the judge let that scumbag out of jail on bail. One of them down in Yarmouth had 110 arrests. He was let out on bail and then he ended up killing a police officer. Another one just the other day, last week or so, in Weymouth. Went to that one too. They let him out on bail, selling crack to kids. What's he doing out on the street? But it is, certainly is, say it with me, but it is, certainly is your responsibility, he's talking to the church, to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Why we need revival. These things are not being done anymore. And that's why we don't have revival. Let's just go with the flow, you know. We're all sinners. I know the two of you weren't here, but a few weeks ago I asked everyone here, is anyone here a sinner? And half of the church raised their hands. I said, come on up and get saved. Reason being is because you're, if you're a Christian, born again, and the Spirit of God is living in you, you're no, living, you're no longer living according to your sinful nature. You've got a new nature. God's put a new nature in you. You're no longer a sinner in that aspect. doesn't mean you don't sin. But you're not controlled by that sinful nature anymore. And if you're still a sinner, controlled by your sinful nature, you need to get saved. Next verse. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. That's not easy. I'll tell you a story about Brother Diamond, David Diamond, his church. He had a man coming to his church, and he had four, about 400 people coming to his church at one time. And his son was a, was a, a, a police officer, and he had a girlfriend. And him and his mother, and him and his girlfriend went to church. And every time Brother Diamond would speak about adultery, not knowing anything. He did that for maybe a couple of months off and on, you know, different times. And the father approached him one day and said, Brother Diamond, I don't know if you know this or not, but my son attends church with me. And he's living with his girlfriend. And he's quite uncomfortable when you talk about fornication and adultery. And he said, I'm, I'm, I've come to you to ask you to, please, don't talk about those things. Not to, to say those things. It makes him uncomfortable. And I want him to be here in church with me. Of course, you all know Brother Diamond's response. What? He said, yeah. He says, I, I don't want you to speak on those, those, those topics, yeah, brother, if you can. He says, I can't do that. He says, if, 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 I, if I feel the Holy Ghost and wants me to preach, I'm going to preach the Word. I'm only preaching the Word. I'm not preaching my, my, what I think. So I'm just preaching the Word. He says, well, he says, you can't do that. And David said, well, why not? He said, well, 
Brother David, he says, do you know how much tithe I give a month here? He says, I tithe $10,000 a month. He says, and if you don't curl your preaching, I might just have to stop tithing. It took David Diamond about three seconds. He said, let me tell you something. You take your tithe and let the door hit you with a good Lord split you. But see, that's why we don't have revival. Because people are coming in, they're rebellious. You didn't have to worry about, in biblical days, about rebellious kids. Read the Bible. Now, I'm not advocating doing this, so I'm just giving you a misnomer right now. Anybody watching, please. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. In fact, I thought about making a T-shirt, you know, having an old prophet with his son, you know, and his arm walking down the road, and his son looking up at the father and saying, Dad, you're taking me to a rock concert. But all the time you see all the elders with the stones. People are looking at me funny. You don't know what it means, does it? In the old days, in the Old Testament, if a, if a child was rebellious, I'm not talking about one time. I'm talking about living a rebellious lifestyle. They would take that kid out in a field and they'd stone him to death. Do you think that would kind of deter people from being rebellious? You know what they do in Turkey and some of these uh, uh, Muslim countries when you get caught stealing? They cut your hand off. So when a person goes around with one hand, they know that that person was a thief. Can I tell you, there are more and more things creeping into the church of Jesus Christ. And unless we put a stop to it, unless we say no more, it's going to get worse. I mean, think about it. We've had people crawling around on all fours with a, a woman with a leash saying that's her husband, and walking around, he's barking like a dog and saying that's a revival. That's not revival, that's insanity. Or people howling like a wolf and calling it revival. Come on, somebody. Those are the things that happen in Toronto. I'm not, no, I don't know if you're familiar with the Kondalini spirit. Look it up. It's a, it's a Hindu practice. They say that to release the Kondalini spirit, there's a, there's a serpent at the end of your tailbone, and what they do is they pray over you to release that in your body. And you know what people do? They shake. Just like Pentecostals, they shake. Some of them speak in tongues. They, they twerk and all kinds of stuff. And that has crept into the church, too. I wonder how God's going to judge that holy laughter movement. Because I don't see anything funny about people dying and going to hell. See, we've allowed things in the church because no one's got the, the guts to stand up and say, no, it is wrong. Living unholy is wrong. Remove that evil person from you. Now, let me say this. That doesn't mean that you don't love that person. It doesn't mean that you don't have a heart of restoration for that person. And you always let that person know that they are welcome back into the family of God, into the church, if they repent. But you can't play games. Let me tell you something. There was two people that lied to the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. Under grace. Under grace. Not under law, under grace. Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Ghost. 
But it was, it was Peter, right, that asked the question. But they said, you lied unto the Holy Ghost. But it was Peter that asked the question. Why did they lie unto the Holy Ghost when Peter asked the question? Because it wasn't Peter asking the question. It was the Holy Ghost through Peter was asking the question. And they both died. Do you think that can happen again? It happens all the time. You know that there are people in the church because they have not, um, they have not appropriated communion properly. They're doing things secretly, yet in the outward they want to seem, uh, they want to seem like they're, they're okay with God and they, they participate in communion. And the Bible says, many are sick among you and some have even fallen asleep. Can I tell you, here's an answer, brother. Sometimes you may wonder why some people don't get healed. But some people don't. Some of them is because they're living in rebellion and the sickness is a result of their co taking communion on, on an unworthy manner. And no matter how much prayer or fasting you do over that person, if they're under God's judgment, unless they repent, they won't be healed. Amen? Now, after explaining all of this to you, and this is in your Bible, you need to go home and read it. Can you imagine if, if one Sunday morning I came in and I, I called out somebody in the church and said, you're living like the devil, I'm going to turn you over to Satan. How many people would leave the church? <laughs> Pastor's lost his, 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 uh, his mind. Pastor just turned someone over to Satan that his flesh might be destroyed. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. If he's a real Christian then his flesh should be crucified with Christ. Christ will be dealing with his flesh. But see, now he's going to be turned over to Satan in hopes that he will be saved. So now he's going to be under discipline. Ouch. Why we need revival? Because the church is almost dead. Listen to what I'm telling you. When I say the church, I'm not talking about a building, a denomination. I'm talking about a people. I'm talking about you, the church, me, the church. Unless we're willing to be revived, we're in big trouble. God is coming. God is here. Monday night, he's here, showing up, touching people's hearts, touching people's lives, drawing people closer. But the closer you get, you'll be like Isaiah the prophet when he said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And when he saw the Lord, he said he was high and lifted up, and his train, his glory filled the temple. He said, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet and said, woe is me. He didn't say, oh, bless me, Lord, hallelujah. Ooh, it just feels good. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Woo, 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 woo. He didn't say that. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in amongst the people of unclean lips. It was something that was introspective to him. He, in the light of who God was, God was shining down on Isaiah, and he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Why are you telling me this, Pastor? Because as you come in on Monday nights, it's going to get deeper. It's going to get deeper. It's going to get deeper. You may come in here and sob all night. You may come in here and, and agonize all night. Come on, somebody. But I want you to know it's a good place to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you ever bought a ticket and missed the bus? You ever bought a ticket to a flight and missed the flight? You ever get running down? I know one time Linda and I, we were going on vacation. And we had to literally run to the entrance. They were just about closing the door. We're here, we're here, we're here. 
Get on here, get on here, hurry up. Got one coming, got two coming down, clowns, dummies. <laughs> Just made it. But how about the person that, you know, you've, sit, you've sat there and you've seen this in the airport. The door closes and the, and the thing starts pulling away from the, from the uh, aircraft. And the person comes, I'm here, I'm here. Too late. Oh, call the plane back. I'm here. Yeah. You want that to happen in the rapture? Once it happens, it's too late. So what's it going to take? Let me ask you this question. How many here, genuinely, how many here want revival? Okay, this is what it's going to take. You want to know? Now, understand now, when you come and say you want to know, you're responsible for it now. If you want revival and you want Jesus to be the forefront of everything, this is what you have to do. You have to hate your mother, your father, your children, your husband, your wife, your sister, your brother, and you have to follow him. You have to take up your cross and deny yourself. Are you hearing me? Deny what you want to do. Deny where you want to go. Deny all of what you are. And follow him. And if you're not willing to do that, he said this, not me. You cannot be my disciple. This is not about a religion, folks. It's not like buying a ticket to get on a, a ride. And you have a right to get on the ride because you got the ticket. No. It'll cost you everything. Everything. Someone said it to me, aren't you afraid to go to India all by yourself? Aren't you afraid to go to Dubai all by yourself? You know what my answer is? I'm not by myself. I'm not by myself. Jesus is with me. He said, Lo, I am with you always. Even to the very ends of the earth, I am with you always. 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 I'm with you always. I want us to stand as we close this morning. I'm going to sing this song or let this song minister to you as it, as it plays. And, and uh, tomorrow night we're having prayer. Come. Come with your brokenness. Come with your broken heart. Come.